Anybody remember the original Ford Bronco? You know, growing up, my Uncle Doug had one, and uh, I think his was a 69. I got some great memories of that old truck. This was a, this was a no frills, all business, off road machine. And uh, you know, for some reason, I thought that little truck was awesome. And maybe that has something to do with why a few months ago, my wife and I brought a, bought a brand new Ford Bronco. But to tell you the truth, you know, about the only thing that our Bronco has in common with my Uncle Doug's is the name. Uh, my, our Bronco has got more gadgets and gizmos on it than Darth Vader's bathroom. And, you know, if you, if you ask me, I think most of them are a waste. But it does have this one thing that I really love, the blind spot indicator. Now, it, this is nothing mind-blowing. It's just got a little light on, on each one of the side mirrors that, that lights up, you know, if a car gets in your blind spot. So this thing isn't earth-shattering by any means. But uh, you know what? It's awfully useful. You know, I've been blessed with good vision in life. And at 49 years old, with about 25 years of staring at computer screens under my belt, I still don't need glasses. And I thank God for that blessing all the time. But no matter how good my vision is, there's still some things that I just can't see. And often in life, the most dangerous problems that we have to deal with are the ones that we didn't even know were there. You know, for the past few weeks, we've been talking about building godly character. You know, we've talked about, about making hard changes that we know we need to make. And we've talked about breaking destructive patterns that we know we need to break. But, but this morning, we're going to talk about something that just might be even more dangerous. Today, we're going to talk about blind spots. You know, in, in a few months, I celebrate my 50th birthday. And oddly enough, I'm kind of looking forward to it. And I think that that's because for the past year, I've been preparing to turn 50. You know, honestly, it, it's been a blessing. Something about facing like this, this really huge milestone that, that's kind of put life in perspective. You know, it gives you a goal and it, it, I guess it clears up your vision a little bit. You know, for me, for me, that meant doing something about my weight. And this time last year, it occurred to me that if I didn't do something about it now, that I was going to regret it. I just kind of couldn't shake this feeling that now is the time. And if I didn't overcome the challenge right now, this point in life, I was going to be stuck with it for the rest of my life. And um, you know what? It motivated me a lot. So in the end, I ended up making a lot of changes. And after a while, things that used to seem impossible for me started to feel kind of common. Like last weekend, we were down in uh, Radford, Virginia, riding in a fundraiser for Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And I pedaled 55 miles through the mountains and suffered through 4,089 feet of climb. Now, you know, if you're not a cyclist, then that probably doesn't mean much to you. But basically what that means is that for four and a half hours, I was either looking at a hill that I was climbing or I was looking at a hill I was about to climb. Honestly, it was pretty brutal. But here's the thing. The real danger to me out there weren't for, wasn't from the things that I could see. The real danger was from all the blind spots along the way. You see, you know, the event planners at these kind of things don't have cyclists ride down some big open straight highway. They have you ride down the side roads and the back roads and the little two-lane, twisty, turny byways that, you know, that go over the river and through the woods. And, and these roads are pretty and they got all sorts of beautiful stuff to look at, but they're filled with blind spots. You're constantly riding towards a curve that you can't see around or you're riding over some hill that you can't see over. And all that would be completely fine if I were out there alone, but of course I wasn't. There were loads of cars coming the other way that, that I couldn't see and then they couldn't see me either. Obviously a dangerous situation. And there are plenty of things like that in life, aren't there? You know, it's that car that you didn't see coming that crashed into you. It was that rug that you didn't know was there that tripped you up. Or maybe it was that Lego that you didn't see while you were walking barefooted through your kid's bedroom. <laughs> Am I the only one that's happened to? Look, physical blind spots are a problem because what we don't see can hurt us. But physical blind spots aren't our only problem. You know, we've got mental blind spots too. Personally, I find it odd, you know, to say the least, that we can live in these bodies and think with these minds all day long for year after year and still have so many things we don't know about ourselves. You know, it amazes me that I can know myself better than I know anyone else. And yet there still be some things that I don't know about myself, like snoring. 
You know, my wife claims that I snore, and I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that she's wrong about that. But to tell you the truth, I don't know. Because if I do actually snore, then, well, I'm asleep when I do it. You know, and it doesn't stop there. I'm completely convinced that I'm a simple man. I tell Kim all the time, I say, look, woman, I'm just a simple man. But for some reason, every time I say that, she busts out laughing. <laughs> Now, according to her, I'm pretty far from simple. In fact, you know, to hear her tell it, I'm a fairly complicated dude. And if I bother to ask her, you know, why she feels that way, she makes a pretty good case. So maybe she's right. You know, maybe I'm just blind to the fact that I'm a complicated snoring guy after all. I guess, uh, you know, honestly, it wouldn't be too surprising because I've had mental blind spots about plenty of things in life. And you probably have too. But right? it was that betrayal that you didn't see coming that really hurt the most, wasn't it? Right? It was that job you thought you were going to keep. You thought it was going to be a career for life and then bang, you got fired out of the blue. The real shocker. It was that divorce that you never thought you'd have. You see, mental blind spots are a problem because what we don't know can hurt us too. So physical blind spots, they can get us run over by a car. They can let us step on a Lego. And mental blind spots leave us open to all sorts of heartache. But by far the most dangerous blind spot of them all are our spiritual blind spots. And Jesus had this to say about spiritual blind spots. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23, we read, The eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. You know, every single one of us begins life with a spiritual blind spot that overshadows all other blind spots combined. You know, our entire eternity hangs on it. Nothing else we do or don't do is going to make a whole lot of difference if we remain blind in this one area. You know, while some blind spots are kind of hard to find, this one's simple. All we have to do is answer a question. The same question that Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew 16, 13. But who do you say that I am? So how do you answer that question? Who is Jesus? Who do you say that he is? There are many ways that we can answer this question. And, you know, when Jesus asked his disciples who other people said that he was, they had this to say. They said, well, well, they replied. Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But what do you say? What do you say about this man, this Jesus? Do you call him Lord and Savior or something else? You know, the Apostle Paul is probably the greatest Christian of all time. You know, the guy wrote 13 of the books that are in our Bible. Uh, his words have affected literally billions of people for the past 2,000 years. But when we first meet Paul in the Bible... He's a Pharisee named Saul. He had dedicated his life to serving God. He, he knew the scriptures backwards and forwards, but Saul was blind to who Jesus really was. And we, when we first meet Saul in the book of Acts, he considers Jesus an enemy. Turn with me to Acts chapter 9, and you'll see what I mean. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath, and he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way that he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Saul was a learned man. He was a devout Jew. He dedicated his life to studying the scriptures and serving God. And yet, we just got through reading in Acts chapter 9 that he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. You know, and not only that, Saul was completely convinced that he was serving God while he did it. You know, in other words, Saul had a spiritual blind spot. He needed some light to shine on the things he couldn't see. But not just any light was going to do. Saul needed the light of the world. You see... Only the light of Jesus can cure our spiritual blind spots. Let's continue reading in Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 3. As he approached Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, 
and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. So now, Paul's got a pretty serious physical blind spot, doesn't he? You know, in fact, I mean, he doesn't have a blind spot. He's completely blind. But what about that spiritual blind spot? What happened to it? Well, let's see. Now, there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there... Ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. Now look, I want you to notice something here, guys. This is Jesus speaking to Ananias. And Jesus said that Saul was praying to him. But just a few days ago, Saul thought Jesus was an enemy of God. And he was so sure that Jesus was a villain that he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. But Saul, you know, he's no fool. He knew better than to pray to an enemy and a villain. I mean, I hope we all do. But now Saul is praying to Jesus. See, he's seen the light. His spiritual blind spot has been removed. And now Saul knows who Jesus really is. Now, let's press the pause button here for just a second. I want to share another story with you. I've, uh, I've been getting a lot braver on my bicycle lately. And uh, a few weeks ago, I, I've signed up for this event called the Storming of Thunder Ridge. It's 45 miles, you know, through the Blue Ridge Mountains. And, and sometimes when I sign up for a ride, I don't really know, you know, what I'm getting myself into. But guys, you know, when a fellow signs up for a ride named something like that, yeah, he can't really go complaining when things get hard. And believe me, it got hard. <laughs> And somewhere well past the way too late to turn back now point, I saw this sign and, and it had this big red arrow pointing up and to the left on it. And underneath it was written, look at your future. So, so I looked and what I saw was completely breathtaking. You know, on the back of this big green field was this huge bank of billowy white clouds and sticking right up through the middle of them was the peak of the mountain that I was climbing. You know, if, if I had been in my right mind, I would have gotten off the bike and, and just, you know, enjoyed the view for a while. But to tell you the truth, that hill was just way too steep and I was in too much pain, so I just kept pushing the pedals. But, you know, I, I, I started to think about just how much this view was like my walk with Jesus. The clouds obscured everything but the destination. I, I couldn't see the hills I was going to have to climb. I couldn't see you know, any of the obstacles I was going to have to avoid. I couldn't see the dangers. All I could see was the finish line. You know, uh, things are, are, are often that way when we follow Jesus. Am I right? You know, we, we may not know what tomorrow holds. In fact, usually we don't. But we do know where we're going to be in the end. So that brings me to a question. Why? Why did Jesus remove this spiritual blind spot from Saul? You know, was it, was it just so that Saul could go to heaven? Let's keep reading. Find out. In Acts 9.13, we read this. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've, been, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he's authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, Go. For Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Does that surprise you? You know, I mean, is it, is it a surprise to you that Saul was going to have to suffer for Jesus? You know, for years when I read that, I thought, you know, maybe, maybe Saul's being punished, right, for all that persecuting of the other Christians. But you know what? I was missing the point. God had a plan for Saul's life. He always knew what Saul was going to do. He always knew about the spiritual blind spot that Saul was going to have, and he always knew what he was going to have to do to heal him. None of this surprised God, and God intended to use every bit of it for Saul's good, just like he does with everything else for all of us. In Romans 8, 28, we read, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. Everything, even our blind spots, 
And why does he do that? You know, is it so we can just sit around fat and happy and waiting to receive our inheritance in heaven? No. Romans 8, 29 explains, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Like God wasn't punishing Saul. He was changing him. He was changing him into the likeness of Jesus. And what was Jesus like? Well, Saul wouldn't be called Saul for much longer. Eventually, he would be known as Paul. And many years later, Paul uh, would write this about Jesus to the church in Philippi. In Philippians 2, verses 6 and 8, we read, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a, humble, as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. So if Saul was being conformed into the image of Jesus, this, this suffering servant, this humble slave that gave up the riches of heaven and suffered and died a criminal's death on the cross, is it any surprise that Saul or Paul was going to have to suffer too? It's not, is it? Well, what about you and me? Why did Jesus save us? Why is he willing to remove the most dangerous blind spot of all from our lives? Why does he want to open our spiritual eyes? Why does he offer to save us? For the same reason he saved Saul, so that we can be a part of his plan to remove the spiritual blind spots from others. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. And now, to those who follow him, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And what does that mean? What does it mean to be the light of the world? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul gives us a description of what that looks like. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like flat, fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. Who is this man, Jesus? If you say he's king and savior and brother and friend, if you've submitted your life to his lordship, then his light is shining in your heart even now. And that light can help others see past the blind spots in their lives too. Well, you know, maybe you're wondering, you know, how something like this can happen. Or, or maybe what you're thinking is, look, you know, this is fine for Paul. Right? He's an apostle. He's appointed, appointed by Jesus to spread the good news. You know, maybe you're even thinking, you know what, this is fine for this pastor up here on this monitor, because that guy's been called to preach and teach, but you know, what does that do for me? Well, what about all the people that Jesus called and saved that he didn't ask to preach and teach? Well, what can we do? Well, let's see what Paul has to say about that in the next two verses. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through, our, through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Friends, Jesus didn't promise you that you would live your best life now while you waited for his return. You know what? He promised... What he promised all of us that follow him is that we'd have trouble and we'd have su suffering. We'd have persecutions. Why? Why? Why do you think he did that? Why would he allow that? Well, it's like Paul said in verse 10, through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. When we suffer, others can see the light of Christ in our lives. And you may be wondering what that looks like. Well, not to put too fine a point on it, but that looks like Unga. Unga lives in India. He and his family are about the only Christians that live in his village. And, and one night, this group of men from Unga's village decided to do something about that. And when they arrived at Unga's house, there was no one home except for Unga's 16-year-old son, Samaru. So these men just made the best of it, and they took Samaru instead. 
Two weeks later, Samaru's body was found in the jungle near the village. He had, he had been beaten to death. You know, the men that killed Samaru weren't strangers to Unga. They live in his village, and right? he's known them his whole life. But Unga doesn't want revenge. In fact, you know, this is what he says about that. He says, when I see them, I don't get angry. I smile at them, love them, and pray for them because they also have to know Jesus. He says, it's better to live and face trouble for the Lord than, and go to heaven and live in eternity with Him than to live in this world with sin and go to hell. Don't fear people who can destroy the body, but fear the Lord. Tell me, brothers, can you see the light of Jesus shining through on this life? I can. You know, I, I hope, I hope that I never experience suffering like Ungas. I hope none of us do, but brothers, I pray we can all have a faith like his. You know, a faith that can endure the pain of a murdered 16-year-old son and still have the compassion to pray for his murderers. Where does a faith like that come from? Right? A faith like Ungas doesn't come from anything that we do. A faith like that is given to us by God. The strength to endure that kind of tragedy and yet still trust Jesus and pray for those that persecute us must come from the one who gives us the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. But is there anything that we can do? You know, now that our spiritual blind spots have been removed and our eyes have been opened, well, Paul explains that we can fix our eyes on something other than the world around us. Let's let him tell it. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus, so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith that the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be a great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. And that's why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and that will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things we cannot see. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. I'm amazed by Unga's faith. You know, I am. I'm amazed. I'm amazed. But I'm not amazed by the actions of his neighbors. You know, how can I be? How can, how can any of us be amazed by that? We've been surrounded by the horrible things that one man can do to another our whole lives, haven't we? But it wasn't always this way. God didn't design it to be this way. In the beginning, God created this, created a perfect world, a world with no sin, with no evil actions. He created man to have a perfect relationship with him. But those first men rebelled. They turned against him and sin entered the world. Now look, you, you know, you and I, we didn't commit those first sins, but we've certainly sinned ourselves, haven't we? Maybe, hopefully, we've never broken into another man's house and killed his son like Unga's neighbors, but we've done other things, haven't we? Things that we, that we knew were wrong. All of us have. And God is perfectly holy. That means he has absolutely nothing to do with sin. And God is perfectly just. That means he can't just simply turn a blind eye to the sins that we've done. They must be punished. But God is also full of mercy and grace. And that's why he sent Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, left behind the perfection of heaven out of love for you and me. He was born into our world as a helpless child. He lived as we do. He grew as we do. He did everything like us except he never sinned. He lived a perfect life. And he was crucified on a cross. And as he hung there, God the Father hung all the sins of men, every lie you've ever told, every lustful thought you've ever had, every hurtful action you've ever taken, every sin of every person for all time was laid upon him, was punished upon him. And just before he died, he cried out, it is finished. For you and I, that means that the debt has been paid in full. And though he died, 
His body didn't waste away in the grave. Jesus rose to life again, proving that he was who he said he was, the perfect Son of God. Without Jesus, brothers, we are lost. We owe God a debt that we can't pay without Jesus. Even the good things we try to do are completely misguided, just like Saul, who thought he was serving God by eagerly trying to kill Christians. Jesus is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. None of us can come to the Father by any other means. So what do you say about this man, this Jesus? He is, the, he is offering you the most valuable gift you could ever receive. Eternal life filled with wonders we can't even imagine. And if you'd like to receive that gift today, you can. But to receive this gift is to reject something else. God calls it repentance. You know, when we repent, we reject one way of doing things in favor of another way, a better way. We reject any notion that we can save ourselves. We reject the sins that we've been committing all our lives. We reject our right to make up our own rules and go our own way. And we accept Jesus as Lord. We accept Him as our King, as our ultimate authority over every single part of our lives. We also accept Him as our friend. And if we do that, we can call Him Lord. And if we can call Him Lord, then we can simply call out, Save me, Lord. And all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Only Jesus can remove the spiritual blind spots from your life. And, and you can trust Him with all the other blind spots you've got as well. He'll use every single one of them for your good. And He'll get you safely home to heaven where you'll never be blind again. And let me pray for you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the blessings that you've poured out in our life. We thank you even for the blind spots that we have because we know that you've used all things for good. We know that there's nothing that we can do that could ever separate us from your love. And we thank you for that. And Father, we ask that you would use every part of our lives in service to you. We ask that you would use every part of our lives to make us more like Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.